Welcome everyone to Legally Speaking. I'm Sonya Brown. And I'm Kenya Johnson. Legally Speaking is brought to you by the Georgia Association of Black Women Attorneys, GABWA. GABWA is a voluntary bar association whose mission it is is to serve young women and children and empower our communities. This show is not intended to provide any type of legal advice, so if you feel that you have a legal concern or a legal issue, we encourage you to consult an attorney. On today's show, we'll be discussing juveniles and the criminal justice system. Stay with us. Please join GABWA this month for one of its many sponsored events. Welcome back to Legally Speaking. Our guests today include GABWA's own Honorable Desiree Piegler, Chief Judge of the DeKalb County Juvenile Court. We also have former Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice, Amy Howe. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Hi. Let's start off with a few questions about juvenile and the criminal justice systems. Uh, let me ask you, here in the state of Georgia, who is considered to be a juvenile in terms of criminal prosecution? Well, generally speaking, we are talking about individuals who have not yet reached uh, the age of 17. There are some exceptions to that, but generally speaking, that is the age we're referring to. Okay. So what types of offenses can cause a juvenile to be treated and tried as an adult? Well, some of the more common offenses that you hear about are called the seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, those are the most serious offenses that can be committed by a juvenile or an adult for that matter. We are speaking of murder, uh, voluntary manslaughter, rape, um, aggravated sodomy, aggravated child molestation, uh, aggravated sexual battery, and then lastly, uh, the armed robberies with a firearm. Okay, okay. And so how is being tried as an adult different from being tried as a juvenile? Well, there are great differences. Uh, for example, for those seven deadly sins that I just mentioned, for a juvenile who is tried in adult court for those offenses, uh, let me just mention that you have to be 13 to be tried in superior court for those offenses. But a person who is tried in superior court uh, on those offenses looks at uh, a sentence of 10 years to life. In juvenile court, uh, we are talking about a maximum of five years that would be served. Uh, the other difference that we normally talk about uh, when comparing adult court to juvenile court deals with the language, the terminology. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in juvenile court, we don't speak of having trials. We have adjudicatory hearings. We don't speak of sentencing hearings, but we have dispositional hearings. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, uh, Ms. Howe, what are some of the most common offenses that you see juveniles committing here in Georgia? The number one most common offense is a property offense. So those can be um, taking an item, theft in relationship, or entering a property. Um, also personal offenses, so assaults or otherwise, are common. Uh, and then also drug-related offenses are, are fairly common. Okay. And please explain the juvenile arrest process for our viewers. What happens when a juvenile is apprehended and taken into custody? Well, a young person can be detained by a police officer and they're taken to a regional youth detention center. Um, there's consultation that takes place where uh, intake is performed and a decision is made whether or not they are going to continue to be detained or uh, for a parent to come and get them. Now, explain a little bit about the 12-point process. Uh, we've heard a lot about what are some of the factors that go into a juvenile being removed from the scene after a crime has been committed. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, there's an objective instrument, and I'm sure the judge can talk mm -hmm. about this as well, um, that really measures the risk of that young person and whether they're likely to reoffend, not appear before court, um, it looks at their past offenses, the type of offense that they've committed, uh, and, and it gives the detaining officer and the judge an opportunity to consult about those risk factors to make a decision about whether that young person should remain detained. Well, tell us a little bit about the uh, juvenile detention facilities. Are they programmed to promote rehabilitation? Well, they're physical structures. Uh, so a lot of what 
when we talk about rehabilitation, it's about what takes place in those facilities. The school instruction does take place there, um, but there are important skills around independence, um, restorative justice, making sure that the impact of their actions uh, is weighed and um, that there's some restoration towards that victim. Those are all factors in relationship to uh, rehabilitation rather than the physical structures. Okay. Now, are there any alternatives to punishment uh, other than detention for juveniles that have committed crimes? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the focus of the juvenile court is to rehabilitate. Uh, we have any number of community-based programs that are used. Uh, we have a number of collaborations that we do with other agencies to provide the services to the children and families to be sure that they get the rehabilitation that we speak of. Okay. Mm -hmm. And to those juveniles who have gone through the system, what happens to their juvenile record once they've completed their sentences? In the juvenile court, um, an individual has an opportunity to come back and request that his or her record be sealed. Uh, generally speaking, after a person has been discharged from the court, they can come back in two years and request that their record be sealed. At that point, it is taken off of the indexes that are there at the court, and a person coming in asking or inquiring about that person would not be able uh, to look into those records. Okay. And uh, what is the maximum sentence that a juvenile can serve in a detention facility? When we talk about offenses that are routinely handled in the juvenile court system, we are talking about a designated felony that carries uh, time up to five years uh, in a youth uh, facility. Okay. What are some of the factors that you've seen in your experience that contribute to the juveniles committing offenses? We know that the youth don't uh, begin to break the law and they don't begin to be programmed to uh, disobey and to commit crimes. What are some of the family factors that have contributed to crimes or to the juveniles committing crimes? I think school failure is a very uh, early indication. Um, if you have a young person who is not enrolled in school or has been suspended or expelled or otherwise, it's a very good indication that there's going to be challenges down the road um, and, and an opportunity to uh, prevent further involvement or potential for involvement with the juvenile justice system. Have, uh, have you all ever noticed a link between truancy and uh, the risk of committing crimes? Absolutely. In fact, uh, in our court, we call truancy the gateway crime because if a child is not in school, if a child is not being educated, then that gives them time and opportunity to get involved in, in activities that are not positive. Okay. And so uh, what bit of advice uh, would you recommend for parents that are struggling with uh, inconsolable children that are leading and going down a path of crime? My suggestion, it, it goes back to that involvement in school. It's that recommendation very early on to if you see challenges arising at school, and sometimes those signs can be there very early, third grade and on, um, to get engaged, to consult with teachers, to look outside uh, of school if there are after school activities um, that you can engage that young person in. Um, keeping our young people busy is a very good way to keep them out of trouble. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, they say uh, idle hands are the devil's work, so keep. Exactly. I'm a firm believer that children should be engaged and exposed at all times. Um, let's step back for a moment. Uh, what would you recommend in regard to, or what are your views in regard to compulsory education? Uh, we've noticed in the courts that when the judges ask a uh, students or uh, defendants, what's your highest level of education, uh, we often hear 16, and that's the age that compulsory education ends. What are your thoughts about extending the school year or the, uh, compulsor the compulsion to 18? Do you think that that will cut down on some juvenile offenses? I think that is very difficult to gauge at this point. Um, rather than extending the time. Um, my focus simply would be on getting those kids through the age of 16 in a program that is compatible with their learning style. Um, 
going to a more non-traditional setting for those to make sure that those individuals are in a position to compete uh, in our community. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, do you have any final thoughts about juveniles and the criminal justice system? No, generally I would simply say that for the youth, uh, it's very important to steer clear of the juvenile justice system, even though there are methods to uh, seal your records, as I mentioned. Uh, there are still other uh, mechanisms by which people can learn about what you did as a juvenile. Uh, if you go in to get a job, they often ask for a waiver. So at that point, sealing means nothing. Uh, for uh, the parents, I would simply urge them to remain involved, uh, to be visible uh, in the school, uh, to be visible in the community, and most of all, know the individuals who their children are spending time with. Absolutely. Any final thoughts? I think my message would be for the young people uh, to, as, as much as uh, in the past the mistakes of youth were forgiven, the consequences today, especially when it comes to the juvenile court system, um, are significant. And a great number of kids who end up detained and spend significant time in the system, that's their first offense. Um, so really thinking heavily about the future for themselves and what they picture and their goals and where they're headed. And although the present, um, when you're a young person, is, is, and the future is hard to imagine, um, putting effort towards those or thinking about how your actions might weigh in the future is really important. Well, you've both given the parents great advice and informed students or children about what they can face if they commit juvenile offenses. Thank you so much to Judge Piegler from DeKalb County Juvenile Court and to Amy Howe, uh, formerly of the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice. Thank you so much for coming and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you Thanks for having us. Me. We'll be back with Legally Speaking. Stay tuned. Please join GABA this month for one of its many sponsored events. Welcome back to Legally Speaking, I'm Sonya Brown. On today's show, we're talking about juveniles and the criminal justice system. Before our break, you heard from the Chief Judge of the DeKalb County Juvenile Court and also the former Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice. Here with us now is someone who's worked extensively with juveniles who've been involved in the criminal justice system. We have with us today, attorney Chris Leopold. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you're here. I mentioned before that you work a lot with juveniles in the criminal justice system, but before we get started, tell us a little bit about your practice and what it is that you do now. Yes, um, my practice area includes criminal defense law, in which I represent juveniles who are charged with criminal offenses, and I also represent adults who are charged with criminal offenses in the adult system. In addition to practicing criminal defense law, I practice personal injury cases from a plaintiff standpoint, okay. meaning I represent individuals who have been wronged and injured in a car accident due to no fault of their own. Okay, wonderful. Sounds like you have a very uh, good practice going there. Yes, I do. Good. And I want to uh, talk a little bit now about your criminal defense work, in, in particular working with juveniles. Uh, before you went into private practice, you worked in the uh, juvenile court of Fulton County. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Tell us a little bit about it, your experiences there. What is it that you saw on a day-to-day -day basis when you practice in Fulton County? Sure. What I saw a lot of, on a lot of instances where I saw individuals who were charged with offenses, number one, like theft by receiving stolen okay. property. What that normally means is that they were in the possession of some type of property that they knew or should have known was stolen. In most instances, it happens to be cars, in which mm -hmm. it may be one client who's maybe riding in a car with some of their other friends, may not know that the car is stolen, the vehicle is pulled over, and they're all arrested. That's one thing that I saw. I also saw offenses as far as burglaries, where you had individuals who were going in, kicking in doors, and who were taking the flat screen televisions and things of that nature, committing burglaries. And another thing that I would say is um, substance abuse, which would be possession of marijuana in a lot of instances. So that's what I saw a lot when I represented juveniles in the juvenile system in Fulton County. Hey, Chrissy said something interesting. I know that when I was a child, my mom would say, birds of a feather flock together or watch the friends that you keep. You said that if a juvenile is in a car riding with friends and they didn't know the car was stolen, they could potentially be arrested as well? 
Yes, that's absolutely correct. They could, in fact, be arrested. Now, of course, they would have their day in court where they mm -hmm. would have to go through the legal process to see whether or not um, they had any intent or whether or not they knew or should have known the property was stolen, but it does not prevent them from initially being arrested, oh. um, having to be released from some type of juvenile detention center, and then their case having to go through the legal process. So even though they could potentially be found not guilty or cleared of the charges, they have to go through that whole process. Um, and having their name cleared so they can get arrested. That is correct. And just for clarity, in, in the juvenile system, we don't use the word um, not guilty. We use the word not delinquent because okay. as juveniles, they're, they're either delinquent or not delinquent. Okay. But you're absolutely correct. They would have to go through that same process of being arrested, just like the person who, in fact, knew that the car was stolen. And they just have to um, let it work itself out through the, the criminal judicial system as far as juvenile court. Okay. Now, we heard the judge and we heard the commissioner before talk about some of the things that they see to help steer. Um, children down this uh, road of crime. As a defense attorney, what was it that you saw? What was it that you heard from the juveniles or from parents why they ended up in the criminal justice system? Well, there, there could be a, a variety of reasons. Um, one thing that I would say that I found in a lot of instances that the um, juveniles were not engaged in other extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. That was one thing that I saw. So I would think community involvement, um, being involved in activities that play a part. I would also say that in most of the instances, um, they, were, they were reared by single, single parent homes, meaning women, mm -hmm. and there was no father in the mm -hmm. home. And in, in a lot of instances, there were not even fathers in, in, the, in the home or in their lives. A lot of times mm -hmm. it would not be uncommon for me to have interaction with a client and basically it's just been the mother or the grandmother and the father is nowhere in the picture when I act. So those would be some of the things that I would say. Okay. And, and lastly, I would say um, a lot of times they would not be functioning at the level that they should as far as education, meaning that education mm -hmm. wasn't made a priority in their life. So that's another thing that I would probably say as well. Okay, so you can equate basically a lack of education or, or you said a child not functioning at a certain level and I want to expound on that a little bit but are you saying that if a child is not doing well in school or a child has dropped out of school was that a, a lot of what your clients were experiencing? Yes that's what I would say a lot of them were having difficulty in school were not engaging themselves in the educational process and I'm not saying that just because you struggle in school that it will leave you but I'm saying engaging yourself in the educational process and make it, making sure there's a commitment to try to do well in school. Okay. And um, so we talk about parents keeping their kids in school, we talk about them getting engaged. How can someone like me, a member of the community, help to keep our juveniles out of the juvenile court system? Is, is that even possible? Yes, it is possible. I think some things that you can do is, number one, you could get involved with activities that are committed to helping um, you, juveniles. Mm -hmm. um, there are programs you could have, like 100 Black Men of Atlanta, Big Brother program, Big Sister programs, okay. um, serve as mentors. So I think there are different things that you as an individual could do, but I think it basically involves you partnering, partnering with organizations that has as its goal and mission helping young folks. And you mentioned some pretty great organizations that we all know about, Big Brother, Big Sister, 100 Black Men. Uh, but I know that you're involved with an organization called Let Us Make Man. Can you tell us a little bit about that organization and what it is that you endeavor to do through that organization? Sure. Let Us Make Man is basically what the title says, Let Us Make Man. And basically what the organization is committed to making men. We want mm -hmm. young boys to mature and to men. And basically what our goal is is to keep our young men out of the cr criminal judicial system and also to help them in their development. And what it is that I do, we help seminars each year, but as an attorney, one of the things that I do in the seminars, I, along with other three other attorneys, um, Marley Davis, Attorney William Bodie, Attorney Marcus Sellers, we deal with the area called Knowing Your Legal Rights. So what we do is let juveniles and young, young, um, young boys understand what their legal rights are as it relates to um, the United States of America and living in Georgia. Okay. And uh, Gabwa has an, or, a, a program where we function, we deal with young girls, sister mm -hmm. to sister, we deal with teenage girls. Why is it that you guys have chosen to work with young men? Is that what you saw a lot of in juvenile court? Did you see a lot of young men coming through juvenile court? Absolutely. Um, that's what we saw. And, and to this day, I think that when you look at the grand scale as far as the judicial system, you see that there's a disproportionate number of men and, and primarily African-American men. So what we wanted to do was be more proactive because I spoke in terms of me as far as the legal aspect, but we mm -hmm. also have individuals who are teachers. So we have one segment that deals mm -hmm. with educating our children. We have um, individuals who are mentors. We have a mentoring seminar. We have individuals who are ministers. We have um, healing oppressive wounds. We also have um, spiritual growth and awareness. 
And we also have a, a social worker who deals with restoring the black family. So I'm saying all this that it's a component where we don't just deal with just one part of the man, we deal with the whole man. Because if we want to make man, we want to make man in, in its entirety, the full man. We want him to be educated. We want him to understand about his spiritual aspect. And we also want him to know about the importance of family. So what I'm hearing you say, and, and, and for our viewing audience, to keep our kids, to keep our young men out of the criminal justice system, it's a holistic approach. It's That's, not just one little thing. You're absolutely correct. That is exactly what I'm saying, that it's mm -hmm. a holistic approach. It's not just one piece, but we all together may have different parts in which we work in that makes the development of the complete person and the complete man. And what age group does your organization target? Um, it, we target eight years of age until 18 years okay. of age. So However, it is not only exclusive to that age, but that's the area of age that we target as far as eight years old to 18 years. But we have in some instances where we have fathers that bring their sons. Okay. We've had in some instances where we have child, father, and the grandfather. So we're looking oh, at three generations. So, awesome. in that, so in that case, we're, we're, we're changing generations, we're changing destiny, and we're affecting families. That is wonderful. I'm glad to hear that you're doing that work. And, and, and I think it's so important because I want to touch on something that the judge spoke about before the break. She was talking about instances where teens, can be charged as adults yes. and receive minimum sentences of 10 years up to life mm -hmm. in prison. Have you seen that? Have you experienced that as a defense attorney where you've had clients? And if you have, how young were they when they uh, were sent to prison? Mm -hmm. Well, this is what I say. By law, they have to be at least 13 years of age mm -hmm. in order to be considered a transfer to the adult system. Um, one that I can um, think of is someone who was 15 years of age. Mm -hmm. And basically, the person was charged with armed robbery in which he and another friend, again, what we alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. happened to be skipping school. As I alluded to, again, as far as education, we're skipping school. They were high school students sip, skipping school, and they happened to run across um, a, protected, uh, a projected victim who happened to also be someone young, and they decided to, to, to rob them and take mm -hmm. the person's money. They got $222 from the person, and he was looking at a, a, a min mandatory minimum of 10 years in prison. And at 15 years old, I don't think they really understand the, the gravity of, their, of what they've done and the consequences that are associated with it. But I say that, but that's what I, I saw happen. Um, I, we were successful in getting the case kicked from um, adult system back to juvenile court, and that person only wound up doing close to three years in a detention center. So they did three years at a detention center, and that's just one case where it did come back, but you've seen cases where uh, children, and I say children because when you're talking about 13, 14, 15 years old, we're talking about children, have gone into the adult system. Is that correct? Yes, that is, um, in fact, possible where they go into the adult system. Now, what I will say that they, uh, they make a great effort to segregate them from the older prisoners. However, it does not negate the fact that they're still there. And a prison is a lot different than a detention mm -hmm. center because as a prison, you're, you're in a prison, there are certain visitation dates. You're housed with individuals who um, are adult offenders. And it's different than when you're at the detention center um, that when your cases are handled with juvenile court. Okay. And, and also, just help me understand and, and, and getting educated in this. If you're in a detention center as a juvenile, do they tend to try to keep you near your home or the area that you live as opposed to like in prison where you can be sent to any prison in the state and maybe hard for your parents or family members to get to you. Is, is, there, is that a difference as well? well? I don't know if that's necessary, but that's something that's a factor that's considered. Okay. What you do is once you're placed in the Department of Juvenile Justice, at that point they decide what type of treatment or services you need and whatever detention center faces whatever services they're trying to get for you. That's really the determining factor. But okay. in a lot of instances, I think that you're a lot closer with being in detention centers as opposed to when you have to go to, to prison. Okay. And you said something there that also uh, Attorney Howe mentioned is that juvenile system, detention centers, are focused on trying to rehabilitate prison. Prison is a total different thing. Prison is about retribution, meaning that we want you to hold you accountable and have you pay for the consequences of your actions. However, juvenile court and the juvenile system is about rehabilitation. We want to prevent you from becoming adult offenders so that you don't find yourself in the prison system, so that you can have a, a turn in your life mm -hmm. to go on to be a productive citizen in society. And our goal probably is to do the prevention rather than even rehabilitation. That, that's absolutely correct. That is wonderful. And do you ever go out into schools and talk about your experiences, talk about what you've seen, talk to the youth, talk to the juveniles, and let them really hear what they're facing if they decide to get involved in these types of, of, of matters? Yes, I do. Um, I've done from going to career days at middle schools, ele elementary schools, as well as high schools. And what I do is go not only tell them what it is that I do 
as an attorney, but I also try to give them practical points as far as them, you know, the consequences of your actions, mm -hmm. about hanging with the wrong crowd. And I give them examples of cases, and you'd be surprised the number of questions I get about um, someone who knows someone that something similar has happened to, or they've been in a mm. situation and this is what they've had to deal with. So I, for me, it's been, if we can be preventive at an early stage, then we don't have to worry about it once they're in the prison stage. And just tell me if, if you can, I don't know if you've seen it or not, have you seen a, I don't want to dub it a success case, but a case maybe you have dealt with a juvenile either when you were involved in, as a defense attorney in the court system or as a defense attorney in private practice where they got caught up, did something, but they've turned their life around now and are walking the straight and narrow? Sure, I can. I can give you a, someone that I represented who was a juvenile who was charged with a substance abuse offense as far as possession of marijuana. The person learned from that mm -hmm. mistake. The person then went on to graduate from a high school in DeKalb County, in which I also went and watched him graduate. Okay. Um, after graduating from that high school in DeKalb County, he then went on to attend Fort Valley State University. So I would like to say that, yes, that's one of the Sussex stories that I would know. And I know of someone from a, a personal experience that I have a friend of mine who did something while he was young that involved a theft by shoplifting. He turned his life around, and now he's turned out to be a lawyer as well, practicing criminal defense law. So we're not, we definitely want to prevent, we don't want our kids going that way, but if they find themselves caught up, it's not the end, it's not the end of the road for them. You're absolutely correct, and that's what we want, we want to give them the hope to let them know that just because you've made this one mistake, this doesn't have to be your destiny, this doesn't have to be your end result. That is something that's so much more greater for you and your life, and that everyone makes mistakes, but if, if you learn from the mistakes and you, and you don't try to do it again, then you too can be a success story. I want to ask you, uh, Chris, you say you talk to mothers, grandmothers, and hopefully in some cases fathers. What advice would you give to our viewing audience, to the parents out there, to the aunts, uncles, grandmas, and all the guardians? How is it that we can keep our kids out of trouble? I would start out very simple. I would say be involved with your children's lives. What I say is know what's going on at the school. Get involved with the PTA. Get to know their teachers. Get to know what's going on in school. I would say as it relates to your community, find out who their friends are, mm -hmm. who they're hanging out with as far as their friends. When they say that they're going to someone's house or someone is coming to the house, do like they used to do. Sit down, talk to the <laughs> kid, find out who your parents are, find out things about your kid. And I would say, most important, I think we have to instill in our kids that the potential is in there for them to be whatever mm -hmm. it is they want. So I think we have to start planting seeds of excellence in our kids at an early. So those would be the things that I would say. And last but not least, get involved in organizations. And I really love that phrase, planting seeds of excellence, because all of our kids have the potential uh, to be great, to do great. And they all are great. And I think we need to start telling them from a young age when they can uh, internalize it. Yes. That this is not the road that you have to take. And, and particularly in situations where your father or your mother may have been involved in that situation, that that's not your, yes. the future that you have to have. Yes. And so, Chris, I thank you so much for joining us. You. I know that have lightened me, and I'm sure our viewing audience as well have learned a whole lot. And most importantly, I hope our young people, our juveniles, our young people who are watching this, really listen to you. Watch the friends you keep, stay involved, stay in school, Ooh, <laughs> most, right, most importantly. Involved. I think I always say the best predictor of keeping someone out of the criminal justice system is getting them graduated from high school. You're absolutely correct. And the last thing that I said, one thing that I've noticed that there has been a direct correlation between lack of education and incarceration. A mm -hmm. lot of the individuals that I've come across in the adult system did not graduate from high school, did not get a GED, and so therefore they found themselves in the criminal judicial system. Great lesson, stay in school. school. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. And we thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Still to come on Legally Speaking, our wrap up of today's topic. So stay with us. There's more to come on Legally Speaking. Please join Gabwa this month for one of its many sponsored events. For our viewers, it's important to remember that Legally Speaking is not intended to offer legal advice. So if you have legal concerns, it's important for you to consult with an attorney. And that just about wraps up this edition of Legally Speaking, but we want to hear from you, our viewing audience. So you, if you have feedback or have a question for us, please email us at legallyspeaking at gmail.com or you can call us on the voice of Gabwa at 678-825. 5675 or visit us on our website at www.gabwa.org.
www.legallyspeaking.org. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching Legally Speaking. We'll see you next time.